Good evening from New York. I am Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. Thank you for joining us this evening. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, special thank you. You know, ever so often we hear about the transference of energy and the importance of paying attention to your intuition and obeying your intuition and listening to your intuition. I am no expert, but every now and then you come across people who have studied this type of thing and who have ha who has a lot of uh, have a lot of distinctions in in this field of study and tonight we are fortunate that our brother Jeffrey Noble is here with us as our guest this evening I uh, I'm going to take a short break and when I return I'm going to introduce you to Jeffrey Noble but before I go I just a few messages one let me wish a very happy birthday to my dear sister joy and um, she celebrated her birthday yesterday and other things. I'm not gonna say what it is. I'll let her tell you if she chooses to. My dear cousin, Shauna Austin from Guyana, happy birthday. My friend, Joanne Davis, happy birthday. And my girlfriend, Jillian Thomas, very special and blessed happy birthday to you. You are indeed a gem, a diamond, a rock. You rock. I have to say this. I know right now you're probably cringing because I'm doing this live and you're such a private person, but hey, I am a student and obedient to my emotions and my feelings and I just wanted you to know that you have a very special place in my heart. You're a wonderful person. Happy birthday. So I'll take a short break and I'll give to you Jeffrey Noble when I return. <laughs> We are back. And the gentleman next to me is Jeffrey Vincent Noble. Jeff, good evening and welcome to CWS. Good evening. I'm glad to be here at CWS in your wonderful studio. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Jeffrey V. Noble is the founder of the Noble Touch Ministries. For over the last 30 years, he has assisted thousands of people transform their lives. Jeff has primarily used his gifts in the Christian community at his church in Brooklyn, New York. However, two life-altering experiences, his modest transition from cancer and a spiritual journey to India, helped Jeff to reaffirm his covenant with God and fully embrace his purpose. In 2010, he left his lucrative profession of 12 years to dedicate his life to serving the community and sharing his gifts with the world. Jeff has developed a reputation for helping people identify deeply held hurts and disappointments and then helping them to release the emotional baggage of their past without years of therapy. He believes God wants to show us off. Although Jeff is success, a successful entrepreneur who has been featured in the New York Times, New York Daily News, Black Enterprise Magazine, Chicago Defender, among many other publications and media, his healing and coaching work has been a secret in the black community for decades. Jeff, what would you be doing if you weren't a pranic healer and neurolinguistic programmer? I mean, I, I know I've kind of condensed it into two descriptions. What, what would I be doing? Yes. I don't even know. I would probably still be working in some capacity where I'm still teaching. I left the mortgage business, so I may still be in the mortgage business helping people fulfill their lifetime dreams of home ownership. I enjoyed that business because I was able to help a lot of people who probably wouldn't have got a home get a home because I knew how to um, prepare the loan package properly so that Redlining. Doing if you weren't a pranic healer and neurolinguistic programmer. I mean, I, I know I've kind of condensed <laughs> it into two descriptions. What, what, what would I be doing? Yes. I don't even know. I would probably still be working in some capacity where I'm still teaching. I left the mortgage business, so I may still be in the mortgage business helping people fulfill their lifetime dreams of home ownership. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that business because I was able to help a lot of people who probably wouldn't have got a home 
get a home because I knew how to um, prepare the loan package properly so that redlining was not an option. So I'll probably still be doing that. Where were you born and what was life like for you at the age of nine, the age of 16? And tell us who you became at 21. That's a good question. I don't remember any of those ages. What grade are you in when you're nine <laughs> years old? I can remember certain, I don't remember certain ages, but I can remember certain time periods that were um, very important. Mm -hmm. I remember being raised and born in Harlem. Um, and I remember being bussed out of Harlem to go to an all white school up in the Bronx when I was very young because I was smart then. Mm -hmm. My grandmother used to always say that um, as I got older, I got dumber. <laughs> but I was smart, so they sent me to an all white school up in the Bronx. And I remember how that impacted me coming from a nice, loving, caring environment with a lot of African American teachers and then being put on a bus to be shipped up to the Bronx with white teachers and um, people of color who didn't know they were of color. It was very traumatic for me back then. And I, I went through a whole lot of psychological stuff back during that period of time. You mentioned your grandmother. Uh, what role did she actually play in your life back then? Well, my grandmother was the type of person that she worked in a factory folding people's clothes. And then she worked also uh, serving white people downtown Manhattan as um, we call a maid. Uh, and uh, a maid, she came home every night. She wasn't one that stayed there. Mm -hmm. So she was the one that was very, very, very strict about going to church and religion and everything else. And then when my mother and my brothers moved to the polo grounds, meaning we were in the tenement and moved to the, to the projects. So we thought we were moving on up because we moved to the projects. And I stayed with my grandmother and lived with her. So she had a, a major part in shaping my life and the way I thought about things. And, um, you know. Do you, do you remember any particular words of wisdom that still resonate with you from her? that still resonates with you today? My grandmother didn't say a whole lot. Um, she was more disciplinarian. And what I remember the most about my grandmother, more than anything else, that she could not read. And I didn't realize that too. maybe I was in high school, that she could not read except for the Bible. Yes. That is interesting. I, I, I swear, I don't remember anything else I've ever seen her read except for the Bible. Now, back then, I'm not sure whether she was reading the same verses over and over again. Mm -hmm. But she can read the Bible, but she, if I had, she had to sign a piece of paper or something, I had to always read the information to her for her to sign it. Mm. But she always told me to be the best, probably. She said that if you're going to be a, a janitor, be the best janitor. If you're going to be, you know, whatever you're going to be, Jeff, just be the best at it. That was probably what she said the most. And, and this is uh, true, your mother's side, your mother's mother? My mother's mother, yes. Your mother's mother. And um, what, what do you remember or what special memory um, you have of your mother when you were a child? Wow, I got a lot of memories of my mom. Um, but one that stands out. The one that stands out the most, I was not a child, I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. But the one that stands out more than anything else is my mother's commitment to work. Mm -hmm. I remember my mother was a bookkeeper in a store called Finest at the time on 139th Street and Lennox Avenue in Harlem. And I remember that they came in that one evening and they robbed the store. And my mother was the bookkeeper, so they put the gun to her head and said to open the safe. Now, she didn't have the, the safe combination, but the manager did. So then they went to the manager and asked him to open the safe. He opened it, they robbed the store and left. But they had put the gun to my mother's head, so she was kind of traumatized. Mm -hmm. Next morning, she got up and went to work again against all of our advice, me and my brothers. We said, Ma, you don't need to do this. And she was saying, well, they're not going to rob the store two days in a row. Lo and behold, that night, some other people came in and robbed the store again. And this time, they put the gun to her head again and asked her to open a safe. She said she didn't have the combination. There was an acting manager there. He opened the safe. They still shot him and killed him. And my mother went to work again the next day. And years later, I said, Ma, what made you go back to work? You know, after two times in a row. And she said, I had to take care of my boys because she raised the four of us by herself, basically. So that will always stand out in my mind, how strong my mother was, how determined she was to take care of her boys, that she risked her life for us. So that always stands out in my mind. Jeff, give us a glimpse into a dynamic between your mom and your grandmother that sticks out for you. <laughs> two, two wonderful women that raised you. I think the one that sticks out the most is when um, my grandmother was getting ready to transition. Mm -hmm. And my mother was very upset, of course. But the thing that stands out the most, she was talking to my mother and all, my grandmother, and all of a sudden, her voice changed. And she was that little girl again. So I heard my mother's little girl voice. Because she was saying, Mommy, don't go, please. Mommy, don't go. Don't leave me, Mommy. But it was a little girl. Mm -hmm. 
but this was my mother who was fully grown. And that is another memory that always sticks with me because that's, that's what happened. And, and what did that glimpse into that window of your mother's life, your mother's life journey did for you? It scared me at first. Mm -hmm. To see her voice change like that and to be right there looking at her voice just change like that and see her regress, it scared me at first. And then I said to myself, hmm, she went back to being a little girl for the moment. Mm -hmm. And now I have to take care of her. And from that point on, I decided I had to take care of my mother. And I promised her that she would be working for me one day. And she swore she would never work for me. But it ended up that she ended up, and she ended up working for me anyway. Mm -hmm. I owned a printing company at the time. And I hired her to work for me. Because I figured I had to take care of her. Then she had regressed to a little girl. You, you have had a serious religious journey, spiritual journey. We're going to get to there in a moment. But I, I want to use this as a bridge to ask you this question. In retrospect, what do you think, or why do you think you were given that glimpse of your mother's childlikeness? Never thought of that before. I never thought, that, thought about why I was given that before. So if I had to answer off the top of my head mm -hmm. without any deep thought about it, because I had to step up and be, just came to me, because it was my responsibility at that time to step up and be the spiritual head of my family. Awesome, brother. Awesome. We're going to have a beautiful time here tonight. Um, how, did, how did you come to be involved in this work of helping people identify deeply held hearts and, 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 and disappointments? Well, I've always been good at helping people. I used to teach martial arts and people went from being little wimpy people to being very confident and things like that. But as far as helping people identify and release deeply held hearts, that comes from my studying of neurolinguistic programming. Mm -hmm. NLP. That gave me the technology or the, the tools or techniques to use to help people over, identify first and then overcome the hurts. And at first I wasn't clear on just how powerful and how meaningful that was. Mm. But when I started seeing the results people were getting when they were getting, um, they may have been, say they were in sessions with therapy or talking therapy for 18 months and I would work with them one time and the, the issue was gone. I'm like, wait a minute, that worked? Because it, it worked so easy and so fast to me. It was like, this, this, something's wrong here. And at first, I had become so cocky uh -huh. that I had believed that no matter what you send me, I'm going to heal it in one session. And then the Lord showed me that, you know, I'm not doing it. He's doing it. So, There's so. always that humbling experience, right? <laughs> yes. Can, 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 this might be a silly question after what you just said, but can NLP be used for manip manipulation? Yes. Ah. Uh, Mm -hmm. Definitely. Not, not every aspect of it. Okay. The communication aspect of it can be used for manipulation, yes. Just like anything else. Any good tool can be used for good or for bad. Let, let's, let's set the foundation. What okay. is neurolinguistic programming? In a nutshell, a neurolinguistic program is the way the pictures you make inside your head, the pictures that we all make inside of our heads, some we are aware of and some we are not aware of, how those pictures and the things we say to ourselves affect our nervous system and cause us to act or react a certain way. Mm. That's a very basic but very easy, understandable way to look at How NLP. Long, Jeff? How long have you been in it? Wow, since 1988. 1988, I've been doing neurolinguistic programming. So it's been a long time. If possible, mm -hmm. how can NLP be used to make fast changes? Name your own thing. I worked with a woman today who... Um, today? Yeah, today, before I came today, that has, uh, she's had recurring breast cancer. And I said, well, if it keeps coming back again and again and again, there must be an emotional attachment to it. Because 85% of all major illnesses are stress-related. And we know that stress, I mean, cancer, they say, comes from storing or repressing anger and resentment. Repeat that again, brother. Which part? <laughs> that last part. What, what, what the, illnesses is? Cancer. Cancer, right. yes. And they say that cancer comes from holding on to anger and resentment. That's what, that's, what, that's what the studies show, that anger and resentment can cause cancer if it harbors in your body too long. And she said she had a lot of anger and resentment. And she had been to talking therapy. She had been to all kinds of therapy trying to get rid of this. And I worked with her today, and it's gone. She couldn't get it back. Gone, not to come back again. How is NLP itself different from its application? How is NLP different from its Well, NLP... See, NLP really is an attitude and a methodology that leaves a trail of techniques. An attitude is if someone can do it, I can do it. 
Mm -hmm. That's the attitude. The methodology is how does Selwyn do it? To watch what he does and then model his behaviors. And from that, I'll pick up a trail of techniques that I can use. So that's really the essence of NLP. It's about modeling excellence, no matter what the excellence is and what field of excellence you're talking about. Whether it's sales, whether it's um, therapy, whether it's um, learning or education, no matter what field you're talking about, there are people who do it very, very, very well and, very easy, and do it very easily and effortlessly. What NLP really teaches you is how to go and model that person so you can borrow their behaviors per se or, learn, or speed up your learning of the behavior that you want to take on. So you, 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 so, think, you think we um, inadvertently or unconsciously do that Be because I teach myself a lot of things, programming, whatever. You, you think we do that sometimes? By yes. Okay. I think that a lot of things we do automatically, we just can't explain how we do it. Mm. There are people who are really, really good at getting in rapport with people. They get along with everybody. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them how they do it, they won't know how they do it because it's automatic to them. NLP breaks down the pieces of what that person is doing so that they get along with everyone. Jeff, give, give us, I know you have many, but give us an NLP experience. That what do you mean by NLP experience? Well, <laughs> well let, me, let, me, let, me, let me define it a little further. An experience you had where you use NLP to get somebody from doubt to belief, and it worked. Well, not, you mean besides the one today? Yes, besides the one today. Give <laughs> us another one. I'll give, you, I'll give you my own. How's that? Oh, go ahead. How, how I began to believe in NLP myself. Go ahead. You see, okay. you should be doing my job, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. When I first started learning about NLP, I was like, okay, uh -huh. I, I, I know these guys. I'm a healthy skeptic, mm -hmm. but I try everything myself so I know from my own experience what happens because that's when you own it, when you do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So I had a habit of biting my nails, a bad habit of biting my nails. I never keep my I would always bite my nails off. And um, so I, they, I, they talked about this technique in NLP called, they call it a swoosh pattern. So I said, okay, I'm gonna try this pattern see if it works. So I did it about 15 times in a row and didn't pay no attention. Then about four weeks later, I was like, I got nails. <laughs> and so the nail, and then I didn't bite my nails for maybe about mm, six months to a year almost. Then I found myself biting my nails again. So I said, oh, this stuff don't work. It only lasted six months to a year. And I was like, well, it lasted that long, so I did it again. And that was more than 15 years ago. I haven't bit my nails anymore since then. So that's how I did it on myself. Is it possible that awareness triggers the desire to get back into the habit? That when you became aware that you kicked the habit? No. That doesn't happen? That didn't happen in this oh. case, no. Mm -hmm. It can happen, but it depends on where your mind goes. See, remember... Once you get neuro linguistic programming, you are reprogramming your mind, literally. So you become like a computer then? It become, well, we are like computers. Yeah. It's just that, that most of our programming is negative. Mm. That's the only problem. That most of our programming right now is negative. We are programming ourselves all the time. Just that how are you programming yourself? And if you look at your life and see where you are right now, it's an indication of how you've programmed yourself. So if you're always focusing on lack and don't have what you want in your life, you can't find a good relationship and you know just things just don't seem to go right for you at any time at all it's because you program yourself that way let's go down that road because i'm sure a lot of our, our, our audience who are listening have had that experience or have that experience let's talk a little bit about thinking about lack and thinking about i can't mm -hmm. or jeff is a great martial artist because you know he started from young i can't do that or jeff jeff has thick bones i can't do this or, uh, Jeff is great at mortgage because Jeff is a mathematical genius. I was never good at math. All these negative things that we tell ourselves that preclude us from doing what we should do or can do. Let's go down that road, Jeff. Well, let's think about, first of all, do we tell ourselves that we learn it somewhere? That's number one. Do we really start, to, how do we know to tell ourselves that to begin with? More than likely, we didn't know to tell ourselves those negative things about ourselves. More than likely, we heard it from somewhere else. And we've adopted it to be our own because at the age we probably heard it, we were not sophisticated, did not have the spiritual discernment to know that that was their stuff, not your stuff, that it was being imposed on you. So then when you accept their stuff as being true for yourself, then you respond from that, that belief, from that, that acceptance of their stuff. Because people think, about, I know someone who, who does not spell well to this day, who's an executive in a corporation, because his teacher told him that he was a terrible speller. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone tells you you're a terrible speller, someone of authority that you respect, 
when you're four years old, you may grow up believing that. And then your tests are going to reflect that all the time, which confirms it. And then you people say you spelled that wrong all the time. That reconfirms it again before you know that's part of your identity. You're a bad speller. So most of the stuff that we have is programmed in. It's not necessarily that we came out the womb believing that. It's that someone told us something and we accepted it as being true, which is the danger in all that stuff. Because there's a lot of information out here, so it's a matter of what you accept to be true. You know, I, I, I don't like to do this, but, but I, I, I feel inspired to do it, to put myself into the conversation. I have an experience. When I was much younger, when I was a child going to high school, I went to a very affluent high school, a lot of affluent people. But I never felt that I didn't have. My mother, God bless her, never allowed me to know that it was really lack. Never. So I grew up with a tremendous amount of confidence and belief that I had it all. When I migrated to the States as an adult in my 20s, one of my sisters said some things to me about my dad. And it, it affected my confidence. And my brother, who was a senior in, uh, in the military at the time, he eventually became chief of staff. And I had a conversation with him subsequently. And he recognized something in my cadence, in my pattern, what I was saying. I said, what happened to you? I said, what do you mean? He said, somebody had to teach you this. You, you were always confident. What's going on? Hmm. And right away I caught it. I said, such and such said so. He says, no, you, no, Selwyn. No. You were born with this. You had confidence. You were always very confident. She should not have told you that. So is this the kind of stuff you're talking about? Yes, exactly. Wow. It's a perfect example. That's a perfect example of what happens. You were confident. Someone said something to you. You accepted what they believe as being true, mm -hmm. and it changed the way you responded to the world. Yes, it did. My brother stepped in. Right. God bless him. Stepped in. He says, no, this is not for you. Thank God. He's always had that kind of, we have always had that kind of relationship where I believe, I, I respect him so much that I believe what he says, I believe is, is in his opinion. So he was able to sort of kind of like chip away at that. But it had, it had really But if you had, had not had him oh or someone God. else said it that you did not respect as much as you respected your brother, you may not have switched, you Very may not true. have uh, transformed. The transforming of the mind came because you had a lot of respect for your brother. And you believe what he said over what the other person said. But a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people don't have that. They don't run into that. A lot of people just go throughout life plodding around. You know, they, I, I call them, um, I ask people sometimes, are you a meaningful, specific, or wondering generality? A meaningful, specific? Or a or wondering one? generality. I mean, that you're just wandering around, just going through life without having anything specific that you're trying to do or accomplish, or how you're going to make a difference, or how you're going to be fulfilled. So I call some people meaningful specifics and some people wandering generalities. And I try to help the wandering generalities become meaningful specifics. Because at the end of the day, you know, we all have something to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I always say that Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci created masterpieces. But the bottom line is that we are the master's piece. Mm -hmm. And that's different. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize that we are the master's piece and step into that and own that. When you step into and own that and work and move throughout your life with that knowingness about you, it's a whole different aura. It's a whole different vibration that, you, that you're putting out into the world. And you attract things and people that make things happen the way they're supposed to happen for you. And then you begin to unfold your gifts into the world. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you can just stay a wondering generality. You're going to force me to open up here tonight, brother. Each of us is unique. So does NL NLP respect the uniqueness of the individual and allows for a person to, to develop their individuality? Absolutely. NLP is nothing more than a model of excellence. A model of excellence. That's what NLP really is, a model of excellence. Audience, I hope you guys are listening and have your questions. Do not be afraid. Go into the chat room and ask. How can you tell if someone has really mastered NLP? I, I can't tell by them quoting NLP, I have to watch them work. Mm -hmm. I have to watch them work. What I'm, is the best I'm not a theory person at all. I, oh. I, I care less about most theories. What I care about is application. Can you get results? That's the bottom line. Mm. What, what, is, what is the best way of learning NLP? Uh, taking a, a real course. <laughs> a real course. <laughs> not reading a book. There are people who read books and say they know NLP. Or they may go to, a, I'm, I'm old school. 
Uh-huh. So I went to a course with the guy who founded NLP, the co-creator of NLP. The guy, uh, forget his name. Richard Bandler. Uh-huh. Richard Bandler, yeah. Mm-hmm. I went and studied with him from like kindergarten to grade to grad school and became one of his only teachers of African-American descent at one time. Is that so, Jeff? He has more. He had more since then, but I was one of the only ones, yes. And probably the only person of African-American descent at that time that studied with him from pre-K to grad school. So I spent a lot of time, energy, and money in California studying NLP. Mm. Why were you so determined to, to, to master this or to, to grasp it? You know, it's funny you asked that question. I was into personal development, period. I read all the books, Thinking Grow Rich, The Magic of Thinking Big, psycho for Winners. I mean, you name them, I read it. And so I was really into that. And then I was saying, it got to be more than positive thinking. It has to be more than positive thinking. Because positive thinking doesn't always work. And you can't just think and grow rich. you got to do something. So I kept seeking things. And I bought a franchise from a company called Success Motivation Institute with the idea of starting a foundation called Youth Motivation Foundation, mm-hmm. where we would teach young people how to have the success that I had and some of my friends had at a very young age, coming from the inner city, coming from Harlem. There were a group of us that were very successful. And we said, we're going to share what we've learned with young people. So we, so we were going to start this nonprofit called Youth Motivation Foundation. And for whatever reason, everybody got busy and it kind of fell apart, the idea. But I bought the franchise from Success Motivation Institute. And I became one of their top salespeople selling their franchise information. And it was basically books on positive think programs on positive thinking, success attitudes, dynamics of goal setting, relationships, making of a champion, all different types of programs about success. So after I became one of the top salespeople, I got to meet the president of the company. And he told me about this book by Anthony Robbins called Unlimited Power. And he said to me, Jeff, read the first five chapters, the rest are all crap. So what I did, I started from chapter five, because I figured they were trying to hide something from me. <laughs> and that's how I got into the neurolinguistic programming. And that's how I learned the swish pattern. I got it from that book. I practiced it. Hold on. Chapter five and, 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 and the, the other chapters that were supposed to be crap is where you discovered. Yeah. Your... That's where, well, all of it was about neurolinguistic programming. But the first five chapters were the basic stuff. It wasn't the techniques or the processes of NLP. So I started chapter five because I just figured it's trying to hide something from me. And um, I went backwards from there and I started picking up the techniques. And that's it. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Now we're talking about programming the mind. This is what I want to learn. Mm-hmm. So then I started studying and just became, you know, just like this can change. The, this can change the world. This can change my people. Let me really go and study this. You know, Oprah has a thing called AHA. Mm-hmm. Right. Give me a moment when, while you were there with a guy in California, and I, I'm, 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 I'm almost confident. I'm confident that you've had many of them, but give us one that you remember that sticks with, stuck with you, where you're like, mm, "This is it. I got this. This is good." Um, I think the one that's more meaningful for me would probably be the one when I was still in Manhattan, the first time I trained with Anthony Robbins. Uh huh. And he did a fire walk. A fire walk? Yeah, we were on 34th Street and 8th Avenue, facing the Empire State Building. I'll never forget it. And so we were upstairs preparing for the fire walk to get ready to go walk on these hot and cold barefoot. Now, I got there late, so I wasn't there for the preparation. So they made me sign a waiver. And on the bottom of the waiver, everyone had to sign a waiver, first of all. But on the bottom of the waiver, they made me write down that I was not there for the preparation for the fire walk. So in case I got burnt, they're not responsible. It said they weren't responsible anyway in the waiver, but I had this extra thing on my waiver because I wasn't there for the preparation. And I went downstairs, and Alec Tunde, the drummer, the African drummers were playing drums. I was like, wait a minute. African drummers, fire walk. Hmm, mm-hmm. this came from Africa. Mm-hmm. And that was my biggest aha right there. And I said, that day I said, I'm going to do a fire walk one day. And I did. But that was one of my big aha moments when I was like, okay. That connection. Yeah. So this came from Africa. Why does he have African drummers here and they're doing a fire walk? Then I did some research to find out they did fire walks in Africa. The Kong people did fire yes. walks in Africa. When this village had a lot of illness in it, they danced around the fire, danced around, danced, and they walked through the hot coals. What was the, what was the purpose of the fire walk, you believe? For me, or for, mm-hmm. I don't know what their purpose was. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, well, Africa, I know the purpose was in Africa. It was to heal the illness in the village. Mm-hmm. Tony Robbins was uh, to show people they can do anything, I guess. 
for me, it was more of a spiritual thing. My firework was different than the way Tony Robbins' firework is great. A lot of people walked, a lot of people transformed their lives. My firework has always been more spiritual because you have to bring who you are to whatever you learn. Mm -hmm. Whatever you learn, you got to bring yourself to it. Otherwise, you're just duplicating somebody else's stuff. Let me slip into the chat room for okay. a second, all right? G said, I might have missed it. Can NLP work on people with a long standing diagnosis of mental illness and years on psychotropic medications? It depends. It depends. I've, I've never worked in one, but I know that Richard Bale has worked in psychiatric institutes. Mm -hmm. I need to know more information, and it depends. I wouldn't say yes, I wouldn't say no. It just depends. L.A. said, you mentioned the church. Are you using these modalities, NLP, pranic healing, in the church? I use whatever it takes for someone to heal, so the answer is yes. I don't know why this, this part of the scripture came to me. And I'm not a scriptural guy, so... You might be able to guide me. It just this thought just came about when when the, the elders of the church were saying that this woman should not be healed on a, on the Sabbath day, and Jesus said, "Well, why not? You would protect your flock and so on." When you right. that answer, you give whatever it takes. I like that. Ronald J said, "I like your candor and practicality, my brother. This is refreshing. Supposing it to be the consequence of NLP, I see the wisdom in its employ." I don't understand the statement. Is that a question? A no, no. He's saying, supposing it to be the consequence of NLP, your, your candor, your demeanor, I see, it, I see the wisdom of its employ. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What do you enjoy most about NLP? I just enjoy seeing people transform. Forget NLP. NLP is just one tool. Right. In the right. toolkit. Okay. Okay. But I enjoy seeing people transform their lives. I like the woman today with the cancer and uh -huh. anger and resentment for all those years, going through therapy and everything. It's just to see her face when she finds out. Because what happens is that, when, <laughs> you know, they've had it for so long. I forgot how many years she said she had this problem. But when, you, when they find out they can't find it anymore, you know, she sat there with her hands. I said, touch the spots in your body where you feel this anger and resentment. And she had her hands around like this. And so then after I finished the process, I said, now go find the anger and resentment. And this is the way they look normally. They're looking for it to try to find it. And I'm always laughing at them because they can't find it anymore. They've had it all their life, and now it's gone in, what, it took me about 25 minutes, and it's gone. And she was just totally, and she, as a matter of fact, she may be listening to the show. I sent her um, a copy like, of it. What can you do, Dr. Kokai, your mm -hmm. colleague who was here last Wednesday, uh, said that you healed him long distance one, one evening, thinking he was having a heart situation. What can you do, and this is for our audience edification, without touching long distance, so we can inspire somebody to write in <laughs> and ask you a question? <laughs> you know, it's funny because <coughs> it reminds me of uh, when I was invited to Woodhall Memorial Hospital one time to do psychiatric grand rounds. And I was really afraid to go in there and do psychiatric grand rounds because at first I was talking to myself saying, man, these are psychologists, social workers, dance therapists, art therapists. They're going to use language I don't even know anything about. They're going to confuse me. I'm going to look stupid. That was going on in my head. Mm -hmm. With all I know, that was still going on in my head. Then I stopped and said, wait a minute, Jeff. They don't know what you know. You're the expert in what you know. So I don't care how much they know. They cannot outsmart you in what it is that you know. Even if they've been trained, I probably still know more than they've been. So I've done more training than most people have done. And so I created this scenario in my head. And um, the scenario was I made this picture of myself walking towards all the doctors that were in there, psychologists and everything else. I had in my mind, they were sitting in chairs and I was like 24 feet tall and they were like three feet tall. So already I'm a lot bigger than them. They had their hands tied behind their back in my mind once again, mm -hmm. and their legs were tied and they had a gag in their mouth. This is the image I created in my mind based on what I learned from neuro linguistic programming. Mm -hmm. I had um, Rocky music playing in the background. Dun, 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 dun. And every time I walked towards them, I felt the ground shake. And I saw their eyes go like this. I created all this in my mind. So by the time I walked into that door, and they told me that I was invited because what they said with the psychiatric nurse who invited me in, said I did for her was impossible. And I said, that's the difference. Because I was not trained, I don't know what's not possible. So I'm willing to try everything. So to answer your question, I don't know what's not possible. Mm -hmm. To me, everything is possible. I don't, I take, I'm, to me, anything is possible. 
Let's give it a try. I operate from that premise. If someone comes to see me, I believe God sent them. Mm -hmm. So it ain't got nothing to do with me, ain't got nothing to do with them. It's the spirit of God and them and the spirit of God with me working this thing out. So you were like, you were like a, a well or a body of water. Its only purpose is to give the water to whoever comes around to drink. Wow. <laughs> As a successful businessman, what is one mistake entrepreneurs make? Not following up. Mm. They don't follow up. I've been asked by white corporate America when I had my business, how come your people don't follow up? Your people? Yeah. And I asked them, do you tell your people the same thing? Because there are a lot of people that don't follow up. I was kind of cocky back then. <laughs> You told you told you asked him this. Oh yeah, yeah. I I was straight up. I was I, back then. I was on fire. I was a very successful entrepreneur, and I knew it. And I didn't need people's business. So I had you know when you don't need someone's business, it's a whole different attitude you have than when you need their business. True. You can walk and you can talk differently when you don't need their business. I walked away from Time Inc. Time Inc. wanted to give me business. And I said I didn't want their business. They, Time Inc. Time Inc. They called me back in to find out why I didn't want their business. Wow. Because I was back then, I was doing very well in the commercial printing business. I was dealing with all Fortune 100 companies. Mm -hmm. I didn't need them. And I didn't want to deal with the, the racist policy of this particular guy I would have had to deal with. Because I can tell by the way he was talking to me, mm -hmm. there was going to be a whole bunch of crap that I didn't have to deal with. So it wasn't worth it for me. You know, I, I want to go back to this, this programming that you did when you, you went to visit the, this, the, the psychiatric ward. Or, um, when you were telling yourself that you were 20 feet tall. And these were dwarfs, and they had their mouths gagged and their hands tied behind their back, and the rocky music behind the scenes. Um, is there? There must be a bridge. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming between programming yourself or convincing yourself and believing that this programming or the result of it is real. When did you? When did you get past that? In, in, in your journey as an, as an NLP, when did you get past that point where you could tell yourself, look, I am the baddest martial artist or, or whatever. Let's say something that you mm -hmm. don't do. I'm the, the, the baddest whatever. But you're programming yourself to believe this. Mm -hmm. When did you get to that point where what you're saying and what you, what you believe are in sync? Well, that sometimes that takes time, and sometimes mm -hmm. that just takes. See, with me, I have a lot of uh, experiences of, of things where I've been successful, mm -hmm. so it's easier for me to tap into that for anything at all. But it comes from having some successes in your life. If you have no successes in your life, then you have to continue. Well, there are ways. First of all, there are ways with NLP techniques to change your belief. I don't care if you believe something about yourself for forty-five years. Probably in forty-five minutes, I can change the belief. I can show a person how to change their belief. I don't care what it is they believe. Uh, more than likely 45 minutes is all it's going to take to change that belief. So now it's a lot faster. See, people use affirmations. Uh -huh. They say things over and over and over again until they start to believe it. Usually an affirmation is used to change a belief, but there are actually processes that can change a belief a lot faster than an affirmation will. So, nice. you so you combine everything. You don't use one thing. You combine everything. For myself, I just start talking to myself, start acting like it, and start really getting into your muscle. You got to get into your muscle, into your cells, because... The one thing you have to do is you have to become congruent. You mm -hmm. can't have one part of you feel this way, the other part feel that way. Because that's the way it's going to come off when you're in front of people. But when you own it, when it's in the cells, when it's in the muscle, it oozes out your body automatically. So it takes some time, but you were able to... Well, that was easy because, I mean, anyone, people sitting in your audience right now can mm -hmm. think about somebody who they feel, feel is an authoritative, authoritative figure that they may be intimidated by. If there's someone that they're intimidated by, it's because inside their mind, that person is probably bigger than them in the image inside their mind. See, the thing is that we have this thing called, I'm sitting in your office. Right. You have an iPad, you have an iPhone, you have a, a, a laptop, you have a desktop, and you know how to program all those things. But no one showed us how to program the most important computer in the world, the shoulder top. The what? Sh the shoulder top. Mm -hmm. Our brain. Yes. No one showed us how to program that. 
all these laptops and iPads and iPhones we learn the program it comes with an owner's manual but our brain does not let's take a break let's let's take a break but before we go Jeff let me slip into the chat room Imani said I have no sound either Ronald said um, G said are the techniques you practice being widely used or incorporated into mainstream medical psychiatric care if not, do you see them becoming more widely accepted in the near future? I'm not sure what's happening in the medical psychiatric field, so mm -hmm. I can't respond to that. I'm not sure. I'm really, I don't know what they're doing now. And Ellie said, tell us about your spiritual trip to India. Before you answer that question, let's take a break. Okay. <laughs> We're back with Jeffrey Noble. Jeff, the question before the break was, how was your trip to India? Oh, India was um, a life-changing experience. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it was like a baptism almost. A baptism? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that's what one of my friends called it. She said, it's like, you're going to be baptized all over again. In India, you know, I can't even remember all the places I went, because we went to almost every temple and every religion in India. Uh, we went to Gandhi's place, um, but more importantly, there were some things that just happened there. It was when um, I actually had a fight with God in India, and it, was, it lasted four hours. It was very interesting because all the time I was there, we had been to many temples. We had, you know, and I'm the kid from Harlem, so you know they say you can't bring a camera in, camera in the temple. So of course, I had to ca had hide the camera. <laughs> To, you know, I'm still from Harlem, so you know it's, it's still in there. So I still got some of that in me. So I hit a camera and took it into the temple and tried to take pictures, and none of the pictures came out. They were all blurred. You couldn't see anything. Are you serious? In two different temples, I did that. And the pictures would not come out. So I was like, "Whoa, there's some stuff going <laughs> going on here that I don't even know about." But I think the most important thing that happened was my fight with God and. Um, mm -hmm. God had, that, that night, I had a roommate all during, all during the time I was in India, I had a roommate. Then all of a sudden, the roommate decided he wanted to get a different room, be in a room by himself, which was fine with me. I didn't know then what was going on. And also, I was kind of under the weather when I was in India one day. And usually, if you don't come downstairs to have dinner with the group I went with, which were all healers from around the world, we all went together, um, they would come and look for you, keep the group together. That night, no one came and looked for me. People were trying to call me that night in India from the States. No one was able to reach me. And uh, what happened was that about 4 o'clock in the morning, I was woke up and I was told to burn sandalwood. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I hear God talking to me. No big deal. Mm -hmm. So I burned some sandalwood incense that I had bought from India. And then um, I was taking a shower and God started speaking to me. And he was basically telling me that He's put me in front of the best teachers in the world for what I've studied. I mean, not someone that was trained by somebody that was trained by somebody that was trained by somebody, but the top people who founded everything I've studied almost. And that he is a full-time God. And for years, I've made a lot of money in corporate America and only gave the work he put me here to do part-time attention. But that he was a full-time God to me so he wanted me to do this full time and so i actually came back from um india and left my company on i came back on tuesday i quit on friday the company i was working with and walked away from about about 14 million dollars in business sitting in the pipeline to do this full time now in in this 
fight with God by the time the fight was over. And I, I put up a good fight, though. I mean, I did the rope with dope and everything else. She didn't fall for it, but I tried it anyway. I was trying everything, you know. And um, he told me by the time it was all over, I had cut all my hair off my head. I shaved all. And I said, God, I don't know how to shave. I've never shaved in my life. There's a razor in this room, but I've never shaved. And I said, well, I need to go in the mirror to shave. And he said, no. Go in the shower and shave. And I said, but I can't see. I never did this before. And God said, you're not supposed to see. The work I'm going to have you do, sometimes you're not going to see where you're going. You have to feel your way through. So feel your hair as you're shaving because this is preparing you to be able to feel your way through what you have to do in this world now. I was like, okay. Then he said, cut off your mustache. I'm like, cut off my mustache? For what? So I'm fighting about my mustache now. And because he wants people to hear the accent of his voice when I speak. So he wanted me to cut the mustache off. So I cut the mustache off. Then he wanted me to cut the hair under my arm off. I'm like, come on, man. What's, what's this about now? It's because he said that I would get tired during this journey of bringing healing to the community. That I'm going to get tired and weary. And I'm going to need to feel his wind beneath my wings. And that he didn't want me here there to block me feeling and knowing that he was with me, carrying me through this. Then he said, um, cut off your private hair, you know. And I'm like, well, that's what women do. You know, I'm not doing no bikini waxing. Or that. I'm, not, I'm not cutting that down there. It's, that hair is going to stay there. And he said, no, you have to cut it. And I'm fighting about that, too. So this took four hours. This fight was four hours long, just so you know. So I'm going back and forth about cutting the hair there, cutting the hair there, cutting the hair there. And then he told me the reason why I was cutting this because it's going to take discipline. And when you cut the hair in the private area, in the pelvic area, that it's going to be itching. But I'm not allowed to scratch. It's part of the discipline training that I have to go through for this next journey. So I'm like, okay. So I cut off everything except my eyebrows. He said, cut off your eyebrows. I'm like, nope. I'm not looking like a cancer kid. I am not cutting off my eyebrows. Nothing. I'm not being funny about people who have cancer, but I just was not cutting off my eyebrows. And we battled with that one also. So I didn't cut off my eyebrows. I didn't cut them off. And we went to meditate that morning. And all I heard was monkey noises all while I was trying to meditate. All I heard was monkey noises all while I was trying to meditate. And this went on for at least half an hour sitting in the room with the other healers. Couldn't meditate, couldn't get comfortable with anything. So I said, God, I will cut off my eyebrows if you stop this monkey noise. Boom. Stop like that. I was like, it scared me. I went, excused myself from meditation, went back to the bus. Because by then we were packed on the bus. Had to pull everybody's luggage out to get my stuff, get that shave I took from the room and cut my eyebrows off. So you pay attention to signs around you? I do my best to. That time I had no choice. It was everything was very clear. I mean, it was such a moving experience for me that um, I'm surprised right now that I'm not tearing up like I normally do when I think about it, because it was just that powerful for me. I mean, just the communication was so clear on everything I was supposed to do, and I fought every single thing. I fought everything that he said to do. I fought it, fought it, fought it, fought it, fought it, and then leaving, you know, a six-figure income. To start from scratch and leaving that much money in the pipeline, it was scary. You earlier, one of the examples you gave us a woman with cancer and your mother transitioned from cancer. Is, is it okay to talk about her in this context? Yeah, thank you. Um, that and a, a spiritual and this same spiritual journey to India help you to reaffirm your covenant with God. Who was Jeffrey and what was your spiritual life like before these two um, transformative experiences, life-changing experiences? I've always had a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. My mother's experience, by the time I worked, by the time my mother transitioned with span, I mean with um, cancer, um, I had already done thousands of sessions with people. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing about my mother is that it just took my understanding to a whole nother level. Because my mother first was diagnosed with cancer after she had been coughing for I don't know how many years and the doctor said nothing was wrong with her. By the time they diagnosed her, she was already in stage five and had metastasized throughout her body. Now, my mother never told me, but I heard that she had mentioned someone else that she wasn't worrying about it, so her son would heal her. But I didn't hear that at first, so I didn't know anything about that. But I was afraid to work with my mother's cell. When I was afraid to work with my mother's I was afraid that if I failed, that all the other therapies would mean a damn thing to me, excuse me, because it's my mother we're talking about now. 
So for two weeks, I would not work with my mother at all. I refused to work with her. I was afraid I would fail. And that would really be, like, you know, to me, devastating. So I walked from Harlem one night to the World Trade Center. And I would say, okay, God, I'm not, I'm, you know, I can't do this. You know, I said, you know, I'm, I'm afraid. I said, I'm afraid to work with my mom. I'm really afraid. And I said, but I'll make a deal with you. After a long, after walking miles, I came up with this deal I would make. If you promise me that my mother will not suffer in pain like I saw my grandmother suffer, and if she don't stay in her right mind, because I saw my grandmother kind of get kind of delirious towards the end, if you can guarantee me that these things won't happen to my mother, I'll still work with people. But if you can't guarantee me that, then I'm not going to work with anyone else. It's that simple. And so I, I said, I need a signal. I kept walking. A little while later, I broke out crying. And I said, now, what are these tears about? Am I thinking about my mother, losing my mother? What are these tears about? So I said, God, I'm kind of slow. You know, you have to work with me. I'm kind of slow. If that's your signal that the agreement is made, then please make me cry again. But I didn't cry again. <laughs> mm. I told him I was kind of slow. Show me another signal. But he didn't give me another signal. So then I came back and I began to work with my mother. And I worked with her, you know, all, quite very often. And she never was in any pain at all. And she never lost uh, her, her, her mind, per se. She was never delirious or anything. And not only that, but the day that she transitioned, she had been served communion. So she was served the Eucharist and had, was anointed. And then later on that night, she passed. And I said, wow, that was God answering my prayer. And I was so at peace with that. But the most important thing I learned from it that was life-changing for me also is that healing does not always mean curing. Healing can also mean preparing the body to go into the other side. And that's why I really learned from my mother's experience that healing does not always mean that you're going to cure a person. Mm -hmm. so sometimes just prepare them for that transition. And I believe my mother was fully prepared for that transition. Now that you mentioned your mother, what are you actually present to? What am I actually present to? Mm -hmm. Um... At this moment right now, mm -hmm. it's just the spiritual energy on the left side of my body that I feel. The left side? Yeah, the left side. And with all your training and understanding, what do you think it is? It's the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. What would you say to those who are listening to us, uh, having a difficult time dealing with parents who have just transitioned? I would say to take all the loving memories that you have of those perfect people, the loving memories, not the negative memories, but the loving memories, and just take your arms, extend your arm all the way out, as if you have a blanket with all those loving memories, mm -hmm. and just wrap yourself in it any time you need to. What surprised you about India? What's the what? What surprised you about India? About India? Mm -hmm. That they didn't understand me. You know, I went there, I'm, I'm up there. I'm, 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 I'm from here. So you go there, you know, here, if a brother, you look at a brother, you kind of nod your head. You know what it means. Yes. I'm nodding at them. They look at me like I'm crazy. Like, how are you doing? Man? So it's just the fact that like they, it, well, it's not really, it's just my ignorance, cultural ignorance right. is what it really is. Uh -huh. Is what it was. But surprising about India is that I thought there'd be a lot of beautiful women there and there weren't. I think all the beautiful ones came to New York. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, what, 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 what surprised you about yourself during that experience? That how ignorant I am culturally. That's my biggest surprise, how ignorant I am culturally. And that's the truth. That was my biggest surprise. I mean, I also didn't know that it was as um, depressed looking as it was. Mm. I mean, you get out and, you know, you see cows walking down the street next to you. You see, um, I rode on an elephant. I mean, the people drive like they're crazy. It's like, it's really, 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 it was kind of depressing when I first got there. There's dust all over the roads. But at first, my lungs got all congested from the dust and everything. I didn't, I didn't stay in the nice parts of India. We stayed really in the rural areas where, you know, it was really, the hotels didn't even have, um, some of them had no toilet tissue. Wow. You know, it was, it was like we stayed really rough. We roughed it. That's the right. best way to put it. We really roughed it. If, if you were to eavesdrop your grandmother and your mother talking to a stranger about you quickly, what do you think either one would say? My grandmother would be proud that I'm involved in the church. Mm -hmm. 
my mother would be proud that I'm fulfilling my destiny and doing what I'm supposed to be here to do. But my mother, grandmother would be like, he finally went back to church. Because <laughs> she was a church person. My mother was also. My mother would be more proud of the fact that I'm helping people change their lives. Who in your family tree, whether your grandmother, your mother, great-grandmother, great-aunt, who in your family tree, in tree um, w was a healer or were healers? Do you believe or do you think that there was a, a healing model in your ancestry? Um, in my immediate ancestry, no. No, okay. I think that I was a healer in a past life or in another lifetime. I believe that I've come from that healing and martial arts background. I believe that there was a time that um, I was in the motherland and that I was someone in a village that was important, whether it's the king, whether it's the healer, but someone in a village that was important. I, I, I don't even just believe that. I have a knowing of that in my cells. Um, I know that I was in one of the Asian countries studying healing also. These are things that just have come to me through meditation a lot, that I just have a knowing about things, and sometimes it's, it's almost scary in a fun way to me i'm not scared or anything anymore so mm -hmm. that things the way things come to me sometimes so I, I have a knowing but i can't say my aunt or my great uncle or anyone like that i know my 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 uncle one of my uncles was a preacher i know that much mm -hmm. so if there's any auditory skills they may have been picked up from there but as far as my ancestors as far as my grandmother my great grandmother my great great grandmother i don't know you don't know you have just laid the foundation i i, I during the break i said to you you have to come back here but you have just actually concretized that return visit talking about a past life and so on we, we have so much to talk about and i'm sure the audience who are tuning in here tonight would like to hear some more about your journey and these things let me jump to the chat room for a second i think um ronald j said how can nlp be beneficial to the government and what is the scope of abuse <laughs> by the government <laughs> well um you know, you asked me a question earlier whether an NLP can be used um, to manipulate. To manipulate. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact that it has been taught to government um, and higher level government employees for that, for the purpose of being able to influence the people that work underneath them. Mm. I am 100% sure of that because I was in the classroom when they were working with um, a well known military person that was in trouble. Really, and they were teaching them how to use neurolinguistic programming and how to speak in such a way that he can kind of slip and slide out of it. They call it sleight of mouth. You heard of sleight of mouth yes. hands? Well, they have an NLP something called sleight of mouth. I want to shift a little bit to pranic, pranic healing. Before we shift, can uh -huh. I just sure give them a practical understanding of NLP also? Mm -hmm. So let's say um, I give you two quick ones. Let's say you and I went to high school together. And we had the same girlfriend in high school. We both liked the same person in high school. Her name was Mary. Mm -hmm. And Mary liked both of us, and both of, both of us liked Mary. And Mary would have married either one of us. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of who asked her first. So I asked her first, and she married me. Right? So now Mary married me. But now you started a business, and Mary's an accountant. A Mary's what? An accountant. Mm -hmm. And you need an accountant for your business. But I know you still like Mary. I know Mary still likes you. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of respect between us that nothing happens between you and Mary. Mm -hmm. Now, if I have a history of women cheating on me, and then Mary goes to your house to help you with your books, and Mary says she's going to be back at 8 o'clock, and I say, fine. 8 o'clock comes, Mary's not there. So in my mind, I'm creating things. Either I think that you and Mary are running a little late, or if my past stuff kicks in because of the programming in the past, I'm thinking maybe, you know, selling and Mary are trying to renew some old flames. Mm -hmm. Now, if 8.30 comes and she's still not there, and I call your house and no one answers the phone, once again, if I've never had any woman cheat on me before, I have one attitude about it. But if women have cheated on me in the past, then I'm thinking maybe Mary and Selwyn, and then don't let it start raining. I know she feels very sensual in the rain. Mm -hmm. I still can't reach her. So what happens is that I create a whole scenario in my head about what's going on, what's going on between you and Mary, based on my past programming. Mm -hmm. So the way I treat Mary, when she comes in, it's gonna be based on what I thought was going on. So, so if I thought nothing because I never had anyone cheat on me in the past, then when Mary comes in, I'm just glad to see you, whatever it may be. But if I think 
because of my program and saying that women have cheated on me in the past, that Mary is doing that, my whole response is going to be different. And that's the way the NLP works. It's what, what are you doing inside your head? No matter what happens in the outside world, it doesn't matter. What matters is how you are perceiving it, what happened in the outside world. And that's based on what's in your database. So with a computer, you have the keyboard. The keyboard is the outside world. They mm -hmm. type in whatever happens, right? Then when you type that information in, it goes to the CPU, right? And CPU already has programs inside of it. If you have no word processing software, you can't run a word software word processing application. So all that software is already in there based on your past experiences. Confidence for you. The relationship with me and Mary. I mean, that stuff is programmed in. So your brain goes, okay, how am I supposed to respond to this outside stimuli? stimuli? How am I supposed to respond to it? It goes to your little programs in your computer and it kicks out images inside your head and things you say to yourself. Most people are not even aware that this happens. And then the way you behave to me, it's like the printer printing out what, they, what showed up on your screen after you type the information into the computer. And that's the way I describe NLP, so people can get a very practical application of how NLP looks. It goes inside, no matter what happens in the outside world, you go inside your computer, inside your head, and based on your past experiences, figure out how you're supposed to respond to it, and that's exactly what you do automatically within seconds and don't even think about it. That's called hypnosis to me. Hypnosis. To me, to me we are all hypnotized. By our experiences. By our experiences, yes. Mm -hmm. The trick when people come to me and I use NLP is not to try to hypnotize someone, it's to dehypnotize people. Mm -hmm. Take them out the patterns that keep them stuck. If they were not hypnotized, they would not need me. The fact they can't break the pattern means they are in a deep state of trance. What is it like when you see people transform before your eyes? Oh, and their eyes lit up? It's, well, usually they don't, they don't light up right away. They look confused first. Uh -huh. Because they've had it for so long, and they think that change takes that long. But change does not take does have not take, change does not have to take that long. Think about it. Someone has a phobia. They're scared of a snake. It scares them one time, and the rest of their life they're scared of a snake. A one-time learning experience. Well, we can learn it that quickly. Why can't we unlearn it as quickly? That's interesting. And it's possible. Just every day. So for those of us who say, I can't do chemistry. Oh, there are ways to make you more interested. I don't care what you say you can't do. There are ways, if you're open, to make you more competent at it, quicker than you would think. Think about it. Everything's a process. You may be studying chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. And you may be confused about all the formulations and everything else. But then sooner or later, you understand it. Right. So the question is, what's happening inside your head when it goes from confusion to understanding? There's something, there's a strategy that's going on inside your head when it's going from confusion to understanding. Just that we're not aware of how we're doing it. NLP gives you the blueprint for how you're doing it. Oh, man, it's like the software for your brain. Pranic healing. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> In a nutshell, what is pranic healing? I like to give metaphors because they seem to, uh, people seem to understand metaphors better sometimes. Yes. Pranic healing is a form of energy medicine. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is energy medicine? Energy medicine looks at the energetic body. We have this physical body, mm -hmm. but we also have an energetic body also. Some people call it the spiritual body. Some people call it the aura. Some people call it the electromagnetic field. But it's the energy body. Either way you look at it, the energy body. The energy body is actually the template for the physical body. So wherever you see in the physical body, like the eyes, you have that in the energy body also. Mm -hmm. So what pranic healing and any medicine practitioner does is they look for the blockages that may be in someone's energy body. Because no matter what kind of illness you have, no matter what kind of sickness you have, it's all an energy disturbance. If I use Christian terms, I can say that the soul energy, soul light is not going through that part of your body. Or this Holy Spirit's not going through that part of your body per se. Although the Holy Spirit kind of envelops everything. So that would be kind of forced to say that. But um, there's an energetic block somewhere in your system. So what, what uh, parental killing does, it removes the energetic block. I'll, I'll give you another example. Let's say you're driving down a highway at 60 miles an hour. If one lane is closed for construction, you slow down, right? Because now you only have two lanes. Mm -hmm. So you may, down to, may be down to 40 miles an hour. Now, if they close another lane for construction, so now you're down to one lane, you may be going at 20 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. God forbid, in that one lane that's open, there's a car accident. 
Now you're just about stuck. That's what happens in our body. When energy flow slows down, mm -hmm. illness begins to kick in. Every 85% to 90% of all major illnesses are stress related, emotional stress. So when we start removing the emotional stress from our bodies, our body starts to heal. And we do that by removing the blockages that's stopping the energy from flowing in those areas where we have the discomfort. The, the woman, once again today, she also had pain, with, had cancer, also had pain in her neck. Now, there's spiritual energy centers all over our body called chakras. Mm -hmm. And people have heard about chakras. But, but in the system that I use, which is called pranic healing, there are more than seven chakras. There are 11 chakras that are major ones. Then you have our own about six or seven minor chakras, then there's hundreds of many chakras in the body. So when she told me her neck was still hurting, although that's not what she came to see me for, I measured in her spiritual body and saw that underneath her arm, which is the energy, spiritual energy centers, underneath her arm were congested. Congestion means that if they're supposed to be one inch in diameter, they can be four inches in diameter. That means the energy is not flowing through because now it has to go around. It's not going straight through anymore. And when I cleaned those out, she was able to move her neck around very freely just by cleaning those out. And I don't touch you. This, this is no touch. No touch. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. What type of recognition is pranic healing receiving from the medical community? It's now finally being accepted in the medical community. There's a school in Patterson. There's a hospital in Patterson that nurses are using it on grand rounds. They're using pranic healing. Mm -hmm. um, I will be teaching a course at Harlem Hospital for 10 nurses and 10 doctors. I also give out um, CEUs to nurses. So pranic healing energy medicine is being accepted in the hospitals and in the medical facilities. I mean, it's, it, it, it cannot not be. It makes whatever a, a traditional medicine does it, does, it makes it more effective. G asked, what would you say to people who are skeptical about the India experience you described? That's their problem. I'm not concerned about somebody being skeptical about what I say. I, I'm curious about this pranic healing thing. How much traditional practices and, and, and what we have come to know as old wives' tales or home remedies are actually based on using energy? Give me an example. I'm not sure I understand well, the question. Well, like for instance, I came from uh, a country in the Caribbean where at certain times of the year, like Christmas or so on, they call it putting away where they'll take everything down, break up the house, clean up everything, uh, refurbish the furniture, paint and everything. Um, I discovered later on the Japanese and so on called it Feng Shui. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 is that tantamount to the moving and shifting of energy? Everything is energy. Mm -hmm. It's all about energy management. Your life is about energy management. You know, what do you spend your time doing? That's energy. Everything is energy. So when they're doing that in your town, they're changing the energy. Everything is energy. And I didn't mean to sound so cold with the other guy, but I just, I, I just don't have time to be concerned whether someone's skeptical about what I say. Right, right. No, that's okay. That's okay. And sometimes we, we, we need that. Two of your workshops and, tra and training, how to eliminate mental parasites, and the Twin Towers, I love this one, the Twin Towers that guarantee success. Can you describe them for us? Those workshops? Well, I haven't done those in a while now. <laughs> mental parasites to me are the mental thoughts. Mm -hmm. The negative thoughts that run in our head over and over again. That we're not good enough, that we're too fat, we're too skinny, we're too dark, we're too light. We're not smart enough. You'll never be like your brother. You'll never be like your aunt. Um, I wish I never had you. Um, you were a mistake to begin with, you know. All those things to me are mental parasites. And then we begin to run them in our heads ourselves. We begin to believe it and we begin to repeat it. And then it creates this, this tug of war between our unconscious programming and our conscious wants and desires. And that's why some people can move forward, and take three steps forward and 12 back. Because their conscious mind know what they want to do. But the unconscious programming holds them back. So it's called self-sabotage. And a lot of people do that. Even some of the um, lottery winners. They, they're broke five years later because their, their financial thermostat stat is not set as high as the amount of money they've created for themselves through the lottery. What are some recommendations for stress? Oh, stress is easy. Work out, mm -hmm. breathe, meditate. 
Those are three right there. I mean, I mean, take deep breaths. Deep breaths. Yeah, I don't mean just, I mean, take, like, I would do six, three, six breathing. When I mean inhale for the count of six, mm -hmm. hold for the count of three, exhale for the count of six. If they did that five or ten times, they start feeling relaxed already. Inhale for six. Hold for three. for three. Exhale for six. Hold for three. Inhale for six. Hold for three counts. Exhale for six. Hold for three counts. Inhale for three counts. I mean, inhale for six. Hold for three, exhale for six, hold for three. Just they can do five times, five or ten times. They start feeling more relaxed. Guarantee, money back guarantee. I'm gonna write this down. Inhale for six, six three hold, six. Hold hold for three. Exhale six, hold for three. Hold hold three. Inhale six, inhale six. Hold three, hold three. Exhale six, hold three. So you, you this is this is the rhythm. There's, there are lots of different rhythms. That's just one of them. Who are some people in your field you admire and respect? Richard Bandler, my teacher, one of my teachers, because I've seen him do some amazing things. Um, in the healing field, I, I, the guy I went to India with, uh, Del Pei. What's his name? Del Pei, D-E-L-P-E. -E. He's Indian? Uh, no, he's actually Filipino. Really? But he's an amazing healer and an amazing teacher. Dr. Kokai, your colleague. Kokai, How did you guys... Kokai is like my, my mentor. Wow. Um, Kokai has taught me a lot about, you know, I never owned a business, this kind of business before. I owned a business before, but not building a medical practice the way he has. Mm -hmm. So he's taught, I, it's not, not that he teaches me, teaches me like he sits down with a pen and paper and I take notes. I just watch him. I watch the way he operates. I watch the way he talks to the customers. I watch the way he handles billing. I watch the way he orders. I watch everything he does, basically. And then I ask questions if I have questions. But he's like been like a mentor, like a person that God put in my life for this time to help me get to where I need to get as far as building a successful practice. So Kakai is like my, my mentor, my friend, my boy. You know, we hang out, we talk, we act silly. Sometimes, you know, one of this, the woman that works with him, his assistant said one time that we're like two fat frat brothers. You know? <laughs> Cause we're in the back cracking jokes. We just, we just have a good time, man. We just have a good time. It's been a blessing to work with Dr. Katai. It's he been came a blessing in here, and an honor. An honor. Yeah. He came in here last Wednesday, mm -hmm. and I had this headache, massive. And he sat where you are, like half hour before the show. And I said, I have this headache. And he said, so, you know, I don't really heal like this. I mean, not having enough time, but let's do this. And he got up and he did his thing, his movement, get rid of certain energies. And in less than five minutes, headache was gone. It's power of pranic healing. Gone. Gone. Power of pranic healing. Healing works. It's everything's energy. The headache is a blockage. So he's sweeping around your head. He's removing the blockage. Wow. He's removing the blockage. And then once the energy starts flowing again, the pain goes away. How do you deal with patients who doubt the effect? effectiveness of pranic healing without the effectiveness of it mm -hmm. they're fun to deal with actually really <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um there's some people that you know if oh see i'm, I'm kind of i like to have fun with people so i kind of bother them and tease them and and have them laughing about things but the but there are ways to work with people who are difficult one way is to have a person's difficult to just say thank you when you're working with them Mm. Now they're not saying thank you. I'll ask you. I'll say, Selwyn, do you believe in God? I, I know you don't believe in prayer and healing, mm. but do you believe in God? And most people say yes. I say, while well, I'm working, you say thank you to God, in case He wants to give you a gift. I'm not sure this is going to work on you or not, but God knows whether He can or not. So say thank you to God while I'm working with you. Mm -hmm. And when you say thank you, automatically you open yourself up to receive a gift. Awesome. You you wear many hats, Jeff. Hila coach, consultant, and entrepreneur. How do you manage the demands of all these responsibilities with, <laughs> <laughs> Difficult. with family, friends, and leisure? It's kind of, you know, it's kind of challenging at times because of all the different things that I do. Uh -huh. It's kind of challenging at times, but I wouldn't have any other way. See, my biggest fear is that I, won't, that I will not um, use every ounce of but God gave me before I die. 
So when I go, I'm going to be like all used up. I will know that was nothing left. It's like going to a basketball game and leaving the whole game on the floor because you gave everything you have. So that's the way I go through life. I'm giving everything I have every moment. And if, and if I fall short that moment, such is life. I'm not perfect yet. And we'll probably never be perfect in this lifetime. What are some common fears and myths about pranic healing? Oh, Lord, that's a good one. <laughs> it depends on who you're talking to, first uh -huh. of all. Um, people think you're getting their spirit, you know, and you're going to do something to their spirit, and they don't know you, so you're going to get to their spirit, and you can do something bad because you, are, you may be a bad person doing this, this stuff. Uh -huh. um, that's when I'm, uh, And then I heard a woman call it pranic, not pranic healing, but panic healing. Panic, like you're panicking. Um, but I think the biggest one probably is people just scared that you're going to get inside their spirit and do something. Mm. And I think that's very interesting because I had to challenge a woman on that one day because she was a, a good Christian Bible toting woman. And she told me about she don't have to be careful about who gets in her spirit and everything else. And I asked her, have you ever been to the doctor? And she said, yes. I said, well, if I had an operation, she said, a couple. Did you ask the, uh, did you ask the doctor what his religious beliefs were? He's inside your physical body and your spiritual body. Mm -hmm. You have no idea what his beliefs are. And if you really believe that God can use anyone, how do you know God's not using me to be a blessing to you? So sometimes I challenge people if I'm in the mood. Sometimes I say, you know what? There's another one that'll say, well, it wasn't their time yet. God shows up right on time. It wasn't my time yet. And it could have been their time. See, my whole thing, Selwyn, with that is that people always say, in God's time or you know he may not be here when you want him but he'll show up right on time mm -hmm. right on time for most people is when they recognize that God has blessed them because mm -hmm. God could have tried to bless you three or four times before but you were listening looking for it a certain way yes so you missed the blessing the first three or four times you got it the fourth time or fifth time so I have you know there's a lot of cliches that you know and you see when you read the book that I kind of debunked some of those cliches you know brother you, you mentioned that right um, the book. Let's let's just take a minute and just tell the audience. You can put it on the camera. That's fine. This the camera? Yes, yeah, right there, right there. <laughs> <laughs> is the church as is really enough? Right. Is church as is really enough? Yes. What inspired this book? What what is it about? This book was inspired because what happened is that because I go to church. And I'm an elder in the church. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of suffering, and it's unnecessary suffering at some point. But because the church has conditioned people to think about things just in one way, mm -hmm. if it's not that one way, then people are not usually open to it. That it prevents tools like these that can transform people's lives from entering into the hospital, which the church is, to heal the people. And so the whole book to me is about, hey, guys, let's be open to things outside the Bible. Let's not stop doing what we're doing in church. Let's add this to what we do in church. Because if you ask most pastors, they supposed to be working with our spirits and our souls. But most pastors, and I say most, I mean 99% of them have no idea what the spiritual anatomy is. Now, you're handling my spirit. You help me grow spiritually, but you don't know the spiritual anatomy. It's, it's, it's a problem with that for me. So you get a lot of pushback from some pastors? Some do, but it's hard to really, de you can debate with me if you want to, mm -hmm. but there's some things that's true. Number one, you don't know the spiritual body, but you're supposed to be helping people grow spiritually. That's number one. Number two is that the way we teach people to do things in church sometimes has been outdated. And what I mean by that is if someone is hurt in church and they need prayer or they need healing, we are taught in church to pray for them. Grab their hands, bow your hands, and you pray. That's what most people teach in church. So my question is, where did Jesus do that in the Bible? Where did Jesus hold anyone's hand and pray for them to heal? You went there, brother. I just asked the question. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting for some seminary people and some pastors I know to show me the scriptures where Jesus held someone's hand, where we do in church, pray with them and anoint them to heal. But that's what we do in church. So I'm just saying, hey, why don't we look at some other things that can help our people heal? And the other thing, one more thing about in the book is about the fact that if we're supposed to be following Christians, supposed to be following Jesus Christ, yes, right, then every church should have a very intentional healing ministry. 
We got dance ministries. We got music ministries. We got this ministry, that ministry. But how many churches have a real intentional healing ministry? If we're following Christ, we should have. Preach, brother. That's, that's the way I feel about yes. it. So what I'm saying to the churches is that, hey, listen, let's partner up. Let me come in, talk to you, and let's see what we can do about really doing. Let's, let's bring, all right, people preach now from um, iPads and iPhones and everything else. They bring that up to the pulpit and preach. Mm -hmm. So you upgraded, you upgraded the human technology. Now let's upgrade the spiritual technology and bring some of this information into the churches to help our people heal. That's basically what the book is, an invitation to let's partner and do this thing together and help our people heal. Where can anyone get that book? Amazon. 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 All you do is type in Jeffrey V. Noble or his church as is really enough and it'll pop up on Amazon. Kay asked, expanding on G's question, how were you sure that these instructions were from God and not as a result of NLP taking root in you? Well, because when I communicate with God, I get certain vibratory feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that I necessarily always hear. I get certain, like I told you, I felt the energy on the left side of my body. Mm -hmm. So that's how I know, because it's a, it's a certain, certain energy. It's a shift in my energy. It's yes. not the same energy I walk around the street with. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest misconception people have about non-touch, no drug? No side effect healing. They don't understand how it can be done. Mm. They don't understand how it can be done. They feel that if it's, well, the no side effects, they don't have a problem with. It's the no touch and remotely. How is that possible? Yeah, how could you, if my sister's in Florida, how could you heal my sister and you don't even know her? I can show you texts right, text messages right now from a woman I'm working with who has cancer. I've reduced her, I've been used to reduce the side effects of chemotherapy about 75%. I've never seen this woman in my life. And I can show you text messages when we finished with our communication back and forth. I wish one of somebody from my audience could text in and ask something. I mean, we, we, we're kind of running out of time. I will risk something here tonight, Jeff. I, I, I beg your indulgence. Give us an extra 10 minutes after 10 o'clock. No problem. Right? I'll take a quick break. But because I have some questions for you, and, and I hope somebody somewhere takes up this challenge and writes in, on, on, go, go into the chat room and ask you a question about some illness, some ailment they have. Oh, I hope so too. That'd be fun. Oh, that, exactly. I Before I go on the break, G, G asks, have you overcome the fear of having to give up a way of life, so to speak, to follow your path? If not, how do you push through? Oh, I've given up the fear. I've had so many opportunities to go back into the, the corporate world and people offered me all kind of money to come back because I was very successful in the mortgage business. So I've been offered all kind of money. And it was t it's tempting at times. I'm not going to sit here and lie. It's tempting at times. <laughs> but the greater picture, the why is bigger. Uh -huh. You know, you have to have a big enough why. When you have a big enough why, you can push through anything. The why is the most important thing. Why do you want it? What's the purpose? And I will die transforming lives. I can tell you that right now, I will die transforming life. I love that. That's what I'm here for. Let's take a break on that note, brother. <laughs> We are back with Jeffrey Noble. Jeff, in the chat room, Serge said, or Sergi said, joined late, what is your religion? What other things to help one heal outside of medical science? You speak to God? Do I speak to God? Yes, that's, the, that's Serge is asking. This so question. That's, do I, his question is whether I speak to yes, God. Yes, do you speak to God? 
I speak to God in a number of different ways. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is we are taught in religion to pray to this God outside ourselves. Yet there's a divine spark inside of us that we ignore most of the time. So sometimes I talk to God, I'm talking to God in me. Because, you know, it's funny how they say um, the devil made me do it or the devil's inside of me. or all that, But they never say God's inside of me. Well, that's interesting. Think about it, though. People say the devil's inside of me, the devil inside of me made me do this. But they never say God made me do something. Our language itself, that's what I'm talking about. When I say language is very important, what we're saying to ourselves, how are we programming ourselves? I pray both ways. Even stuff like the Lord's Prayer, our Father who in heaven. Mm-hmm. I've so, told preachers, I said, why don't you try this? Why don't you say the Lord's Prayer in the first person? Instead of saying our father, say my father. My father. And go through the whole but prayer I, like I that. I used to do that as a child. Sorry. And, no, no, right. right. And watch how the energy shifts. Your energy, your internal energy, if you're, if you're aware of your energy, you will feel your energy shift when you go from our father, war in heaven, and say the whole thing, and make it a personal pronoun, say my father, war in heaven, and say the whole thing in the first person, you will feel an energy shift in your body, mm-hmm. if you're sensitive enough. So, yes, I do talk to God all the time. God talks to me, and sometimes we don't agree on things, but he usually wins. You spoke about the church um, and, and the, the, the importance, you believe, of setting up a healing ministry. What, what do you believe can be done in the black communities to encourage the use of pranic healing and, and NLP, if possible? Oh, and let me make this perfectly clear, first of all. It doesn't have to be pranic healing doesn't have to be NLP. Mm-hmm. We need to set up a healing ministry mm-hmm. period in the church. And I don't mean taking blood pressure and doing cancer screenings and AIDS screenings once in a while. All that's allopathic medicine. I'm talking about bringing some old-fashioned, I call it old-fashioned, because remember, back in the day, your mother take a root off the tree, boil it, put it on your body, and you healed. Energy. Then you feel bad, you fall down, you bump your knee, they kiss your knee, your knee feels better. Mm-hmm. Something happens, you're crying, they give you a hug. You start feeling better. All that's an energy exchange. Or when we scream, when, when we hurt something, or we, we, we shout, right. somehow it kind of numbs the pain. I, I never understood that. It's energy exchange. You know, one time I was in a lot of pain, all I did was keep laughing. I just kept laughing on purpose, and it ha- helped me handle the pain for a while. Because you're sending two different signals through your nervous system. Laughter's a totally different chemical cocktail inside your body than pain is. So, so fear, fear one would say is an accelerant. It, 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 it accelerates the, the, the message what? to the fear. Fear itself? If, yes. If, 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 if what, you're feeling what's pain. What's fear? Right. Right? If you're feeling pain mm-hmm. and, or let's say you get a cut or something, mm-hmm. and you have the fear of this, this wound getting worse or the oh, pain will. that it will come, that t- send, tend to send a faster message to the brain. Than if you were laughing, than if, than if, than if you, you laugh about the, the, the situation. We have to talk about pain specifically, yes. Mm. But if you cut yourself and you have fear about what's going to happen, you're going to bleed to death, then of course the bleeding is going to. Remember, energy follows thought. So thought is the boss. Yes, energy follows thought. I do demonstration at my introductions to neural, I mean, to frantic healing, where I prove undoubtedly that energy follows thought. So you got to be careful what your thoughts are. What are your pet peeves uh, as an NLP practitioner? My pet peeves in life, period, besides NLP, is just people not believing in themselves. People don't see the God in themselves that's there. Mm. That's a pet peeve of mine. I am known to be tough on people at times because I see something in most people. And my job, if you come to me, is to see that and try my best to bring that out of you. And I'll do whatever it takes to do that. Sometimes people don't want to see me anymore. They become like, you know... I. Because they rather they're comfortable being who they are. They don't want to be anything more than they are. They're comfortable just being whatever it is that they may be. And I see more in them. So one of my pet peeves is people just settling for, settling for mediocrity and then blaming everybody else. Mm-hmm. Another pet peeve of mine is that when we as African American people of color begin to use being African American as an excuse to accept failure and mediocrity in our lives and blame everything on the white man, mm-hmm. only because. That's what they want us to do. As long as we're blaming them, we're not going to take action. When we start believing in ourselves, then we'll take action more. And those are, those are probably my two biggest pet peeves, even with myself. Even yourself? Oh, yeah. If I find myself, I am the most, I, am, I do self-editing almost every day. Anyone that knows you will tell you 
I'm always editing myself. I'm checking myself. Why did I say this? What do I feel about this? And then I make the changes. What type of patient do you work best with and, and which patients get the best results? The ones that's open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, ones, the ones that's closed get results also just a little tougher for me. It takes a little longer sometimes, but they're the most fun to work with sometimes because, you know, they're more challenging and the people that, like the woman that did the cancer today, she was kind of open. She was desperate. She was looking for something. So for her, she got, I mean, her therapy lasted 20 minutes which, with, with a normal person that wasn't as open. It, and she was a Mormon, which was interesting. Wow. <laughs> How has your profession developed over the last, let's say, 10 years? My profession as far as? As healing. Healing? Yeah. Well, there have been more modalities. Everybody are coming out with their own version of something. They have all different types of names. Let me shift that question. Okay. I'm sorry about this. How, how have you seen yourself evolve in the last 10 years? Oh, by combining different things. Uh -huh. Just taking all of it and wrapping it up with, with the Bible and everything else and just putting it all, taking some of this and some of that and some of this and some of that. It's very unlikely that you will get a, a pure NLP session from me. It may be NLP combined with a little bit of uh, quantum psychology, combined with a little bit of pranic healing, combined with a little bit of uh, EFT. I mean, just you use everything. I, I pull from everywhere now. That's how I've evolved the most, just using the combination. But I think the way I evolved the most is becoming a teacher. You know, mm -hmm. having students that I've actually taught now. And I remember that in our church one time we had a day of healing, and uh, that the, the pastor allowed us to just take over the sanctuary that day per se, or just the healing. He didn't, he didn't do a sermon that day. My group, uh, the Noble Touch name of the group, we had full run of the pulpit area and people from the churches came up and got healed, got worked on. Mm -hmm. And that was very evolutionary for me because I realized that I teach, but sometimes when you're so busy, you don't look back and see what you've done mm -hmm. or who you may have affected. And when I saw my students lining up to come down the aisle to get anointed, I just started crying. I couldn't believe that I had taught that many people. And that wasn't even all of them. Wow. That wasn't even all of them. Then to see them up there working in concert, look like a, people told me it looked like a, um, a dance when they were sitting there working with the different people that came up with different ailments and everything else. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful, it was one of the most heartwarming things that I've experienced in a, in a while. When you I saw say that them. is very rewarding for you. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm here for. What is most challenging for you as a healer? Not being as powerful as I want to be. How do you describe that? You know, what is power? The, the Bible says, the Bible says, Jesus said at one time, greater things than this you will do. Mm -hmm. I want to make that come true. And you believe it's possible. I want to fulfill his prophecy. He prophesied it. He said it. You believe everything else he said. Why not believe that? That is true. So I operate from that belief. I want to do the things that are like impossible to do. Let me slip to the chat room. Sil said, I recently developed a reaction to a food product that manifests in a sort of rash. The healing process has been slow. Can you help with that? A rash. Rashes can be worked on very easily. I'm trying to figure out. Is there just a rash or is there any pain associated to it? You don't know that, right? Um, Sil, is there any pain associated with the rash? And where's the rash located? And where's the rash located? Because depending on where the rash located, I can tell you what energy centers are blocked. Okay. So while she, while Sil, where he or she is answering, is going to answer everything, let me read search said, what is your, what is your religion? What other things to help one heal outside of medical science? I guess Serge is saying that you didn't, you only answer part of the question. What is your religion and what other things, in quotes, other things to help one heal outside of medical science? My, my religion is I'm Christian, Baptist, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and there's, homo, you know, talk to Dr. Kakai, he, he knows everything, acupuncture, homopathy, naturopathic medicine, their herbs, their, you know, the energy systems. Um, I believe that everything starts mentally, though. Most yes. of it starts mentally. Serge, um, as Jeff was, uh, mentioned, just, just mentioned Dr. Kokai's name, Dr. Kokai was here last Wednesday 
go on the website. I, I don't think you will recognize his face, but um, um, if you if you go to past shows under October, you will see Doctor Kokai. Just click click on his face, and you'll be able to see his uh his the re the recording of his show. Sell said itchiness, arms and legs. Arms and legs. That would mean that. I don't know where at in the arms and legs, but that would tell me right away that, first of all, something in the liver has to be cleansed. The liver is dirty. His solar plexus is also dirty. The Do front, what? Solar plex area. The spirit just into the solar plexus is, 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 is congested. Um, his back solar plexus is, de is kind of depleted. His, his arm in here, mm -hmm. he has energy centers here. Mm -hmm. He has energy centers here. He has his fingertips in his hand. All those need to be cleaned to help reduce the rash. And it's like the same thing. He has one in the hip, he has one in the knees, and he has one in the bottom of his feet. All those also need to be cleansed. But his solar plex and liver are also congested and dirty. And, and how does one... How do we clean them? Hmm, that's a different ball game. What I would tell him to do if he's doing it on his own is continue just take some deep breathing, like I said, 636, and imagine white light coming into those areas. Is imagine like white light come into those areas and cleanse. That's that's kind of like the basic way to do it, mm -hmm. but that's what he can do for himself. Or if the uh, if the uh, the rash is on his arm, he can take his hand every day, as many times as he can, and just sweep down his arm. You sweep like as, as if because there's a blockage there. So you want to pretend that you're sweeping the blockage away, so then you can flow through there again, just like Dr. Katai swept around your head when you yes. had a headache, right? Yes, because he you're moving the blockages. So same with the arm and leg, he just continues sweeping like that with white light, white light, white light, five times, then you just kind of dump it off his hand because he's going to collect the energy on his hand. Mm -hmm. Five times, dump, five times, dump, five, about 50 times a day, and then the leg also, that will, he'll start seeing the difference right away. I'll probably say within about 24 hours. Depends on how many times he does it a day also. Wow. But his solar plexus also really um, is congested. So his, his core is coming from the stomach area also. The stomach area, if they're going to clean the solar plex area, they need to take their hand like, can you see, can you see what I'm doing? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me see. Um, you can stand for a little bit, just a little bit. That's high enough? Yeah, that's good. Okay, and if you just sweep your solar plex area like this, over and over like five times, and then, you know, kind of dump it to the side. Oops, five times, kind of dump it to the side. Any area you have any pain in, period, if you start sweeping like this, it will start removing the blockage. But the solar plexus is important because that's where all your stress is. All your stress is in the solar plexus area. People you start, if they did this every day about 25 times, 30 times, they just feel themselves start to relax. Just by sweeping the front solar plexus chakra like that. And if they ate a lot of food that they shouldn't eat, and they feel kind of stuffed, and they clean the solar plex like this, and the navel, the food will start digesting faster. Jeff, Jeff, I'm telling you, I, I got to speed up, speed up your return. Um, describe a typical day of work for you. Depends what I'm doing that day. Mm -hmm. Okay. There, there's some days I'm doing all coaching. There's some days that I'm doing all energy work. There's some days it was either really either energy work or coaching or, coaching. or both. Mm -hmm. What is what is on the horizon for you? Churches. Churches and more books. And more books. Yeah. More books. But churches, getting into the churches, that's really high on my priority list. What is the most humbling lesson you learned as a healer? My mother. Mm. My oh. mother passed. Oh, her passing? Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I thought I was going to heal her too. <laughs> I thought she was going to be healed, that I was going to save her life. What kind of music calms you down? Meditation music. Mm -hmm. uh, classical music. Certain types of jazz. I, I like all music except for hard rock stuff. Because remember, is, that's all vibration. Yes. It's all vibration. I like gospel music too. What is one thing about you that most people do not know that might surprise them? Depends who the people are. Because most people think I'm very serious. Uh -huh. People think I'm very serious and very intense. If people, a lot of people in the church think that I'm very serious and very intense, they don't know that I'm an absolute clown. <laughs> <laughs> That I really enjoy having fun, enjoying life, enjoying people. Um, that's what probably would shock most people, that I am more fun than they think. And when they find out how much fun I am, they said, I never, 
I never thought you were this much fun. I've heard that a lot. I never thought you were that this much fun. If you could go back in time, what would you tell the 16 year old Jeff? Oh, the 16 year old Jeff? And when I was 16, I was kind of confident by then. I have to go back further than that. I have to go back to when I was Nine. bust. When I was bust to the white school. That was around what time? 12? Uh, about when are you? Let me see. That was junior high. I was in the fifth grade, fourth or fifth grade. I don't know what age that is now. Neither do I. Okay. I come from a different system. Right. Well, let's say, well, thir- let's yeah. say 13. Right. I would tell Jeff, do not be afraid to follow your dream. Because, see, I always knew uh-huh. that I was supposed to be doing this for a living. You always knew this? Yeah. Well, not always, but I knew it very young. Mm-hmm. But I was afraid that I couldn't make enough money doing this. So for years and years, remember, I worked, I've been doing this for over 30 years. I've been only doing it full time for the last maybe four. But I was always doing it part time, making money, doing this on the side all the time, making money on the side, doing it in the church for free because I was making enough money in my job. Because mm-hmm. I was always afraid that I wouldn't be able to make the kind of money that I'm used to making if I did this full time. So what I would tell the younger Jeff now is just go for it, man. Go for it. Just what, go for what it. What are you most proud of? My students. You know, they say that you can tell a tree, a tree by the fruit that it bears. Mm. Finish the sentence. The best part of Sunday evening is relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm relaxed, if I'm not doing any healing anyway. We've come relaxing. to that time, Jeff. Um, and this question I ask all my guests, what makes you laugh out loud? Me. I'm silly. <laughs> I just, I'm just silly. I'm, I just like to have fun. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't like comedy. That, not that I don't like comedy, but a lot of comics don't make me laugh. What makes me laugh out loud is and seeing people's faces when you faces. Hit, when you heal them and they're like, where did that pain go? I had it for 25 years. Where is it? And my students will tell you, they see people looking for the pain. They're literally trying to find the pain because they had it for 25 years. And they can't find it. And they look like, and I just start laughing. And I say, try very hard in vain to get that pain back again. Do you remember your first success? I remember, um, no, I remember one that was very embarrassing, though. Uh-huh. The most embarrassing one was when um, this woman called me. She had got my name from somewhere, and she told me she, she was going to commit suicide. I was kind of young at the time in NLP. I don't know how she got my name. She said some doctor gave it to her, but she said that um, she was going to commit suicide. Can I come over? And I told her I was tired. I'll call her tomorrow. That's how stupid I was back then. So I called one of my NLP buddies, and I said, listen, this woman just called me. She said she was going to commit suicide. What would you do with her? He said, when did she call you? I said, a few minutes ago. Just I hung up from her and called you. He said, what did you tell her? I said, I'll call her tomorrow. He said, Jeff, the woman tells you she's going to commit suicide, and you tell her you'll call her tomorrow. I said, oh, my God. I didn't realize what I did. And I called her back, and I went down to a place, which was a course from Macy's, across from Macy's on Fifth Avenue, wherever it is. And I worked with her that night, and then I was scared. So I didn't see her for about three weeks. So I said, oh, Lord, have mercy, what happened? She never answered the phone or anything else. But she had went out of town. And that was probably my most embarrassing one. Jeff, I have to say thank you for coming. It's been fun, man. Oh, too much fun, man. <laughs> I, 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 I really enjoyed it from beginning to end. And I am extending an invitation for you to come back soon because we have so much more to talk about. Okay. And I want to extend a... a Special thank you to Dr. Kokai for recommending you. That's my man. Yeah, that's my that's my brother. We call you. That's my brother. He didn't mother. realize it was so much fun. Yeah, he's crazy. <laughs> Kokai is crazy. <laughs> People don't get to see him that way. Kokai is crazy. That's my brother from another mother. Oh my gosh, that's my man. Well, well, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Really, I You're enjoy welcome. it myself. And this is Selwyn Collins saying good night and fear not what fear whispers to you. Fear your obedience to it. Thank you.